So water structure, its polarity, and its ability to hydrogen bond determines its property. So its structure is related to its properties or its functions. We're gonna talk about five properties of water and each of these properties are important in determining um, how water functions in living systems. So the first one we're gonna talk about is how water is a versatile solvent. Sometimes people call it a universal solvent. It won't dissolve everything. It just dissolves many things, so it's versatile. Um, after that, we'll talk about its high specific heat or its heat capacity, which is good in temperature regulation of ecosystems, but also in individual living organisms. And that's going to go along with its high heat of um, vaporization. And then we'll talk about its cohesion. If you're cohesive, you bond to yourself um, and its adhesive properties. And if you're adhesive, then you stick to something else. Um, and one important phenomenon that uses cohesion and adhesion is transpiration of water in plants. And then finally, we'll talk about its low density as a solid. So um, most biological reactions occur in water and chemical reactions depend on these collisions that happen in water. So the concentration of our solutes is going to be very important in aqueous solutions and all chemical reactions in living things are going to happen in aqueous solutions, which means that the solvent is water and the solute will be the smaller um, particles that are dissolved in that water. So your Google um, form that you have to complete at the end of this lesson is identifying if something is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. If it's hydrophilic, it's going to like water. It's going to dissolve well in water. Those are going to be things that have a charge, like ionic compounds. Those are your ions and your salts. They have a full-on charge, but it's also going to be other polar covalent bond, um, compounds like ammonia that I just showed you before. So anything that has a charge is going to dissolve well in water, and most things have a little bit of a charge. Things that don't have a charge are going to be hydrophobic. Those are going to be water fearing. Those are going to be nonpolar covalent compounds. And that's not going to be something that you're going to have to do in chemistry where you're going to have to like figure out electronegativities and subtract them. You need to know, and it's in red, hydrocarbons are hydrophobic. Remember, hydrocarbons are things that are contained almost primarily of carbon and hydrogen, and that's it. Those are your fats, those are lipids, oils, steroid hormones. If you know that those are made of hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons are hydrophobic, then you know that those are gonna be um, water fearing and those things will not dissolve well in water. So one thing that we're gonna talk about is a hydration shell. And a hydration shell is just how water dissolves different compounds. And what you can see there is sodium's in the middle. It has a positive charge. And you can see all the partial negative charges of the oxygens of the water molecules that surround it. And it makes a big shell around it. And it's a hydration shell because it's all surrounded by water. That's all it is. So if you look at the first figure, that's um, ionic substance, which is sodium, which I just showed you, notice the arrangement of those water molecules. You have the negative or the partial negative charges of the oxygens, and those are the ones that are interacting with the positive sodium ions. In the next image, in the middle, you see the chlorine anion. It's a negative charge. So the water molecules that surround that negatively charged chlorine are going to be the partial positive hydrogens because we always have opposite charges attracting. The last thing that I want to show you is that last one is urea. Urea is a compound that's normally found in things like urine. And you can see that there's hydrogen bonds that are forming between the oxygens of the water and the hydrogens in urea. And that is because it has a lot of nitrogen in it, that's going to be a very polar molecule as well. And that's why urea is dissolved in, in things like urine. So um, in the image that you see um, right now, there are parts of that molecule that are hydrophobic and then there's parts that are hydrophilic. So you see in more of like the brownish tan color, those are all hydrocarbons. So that's gonna be the nonpolar part of that molecule and that part of that molecule to the left is going to be hydrophobic. To the right, you see that 
alcohol group. That's the OH that's sticking off the end. The polar part of the molecule is in like that bluish purpley color. That is has a partial charge. So that's hydrophilic. Because that molecule has one side that's charged and one side that's uncharged, we say that that's amphipathic. Amphi means both or on both sides, like an amphibian can go on land and it can go on water. So amphipathic means that you're polar, but also nonpolar. So there's parts of the molecule that are hydrophobic and parts of the molecule that are hydrophilic. Even big, huge, large polar molecules can be dissolved. So this is a huge protein and it's very large, but it has regions that are polar. So even this big, huge protein can be dissolved in water because it has polar areas, because it's amphipathic. And what you, you see in the smaller little inset is we see the hydrogen bonding that is forming and that's allowing this big polar protein to be dissolved into water. What we're gonna talk about later in the week are other amphipathic molecules like phospholipids and how phospholipids are important because they make up the cell membrane. And the fact that they're amphipathic, meaning that they have um, a polar head with, with that phosphate group in green, and then you have the non-polar hydrophobic hydrocarbon tails, those are really important in um, the formation of the cell membrane. Also, knowing how amphipathic molecules can spontaneously make um, membranes is important because we talked about like where did the first cells come from and we talked about how there were some hypotheses how life could come from non-living things and we do know that lipids will make membranes spontaneously on their own to the right you see some oil just going into water and you've seen this before how water forms um, oil forms like a little spear to stay away from the water that's surrounding it. But if we have an amphipathic molecule, like on the left, we'll make like either a monolayer of a bubble of that oil, or we can make a bilayer. And the bilayer is what would happen when we make a cell membrane, and those happen all on their own. 